Hey guys, um, this is going to be a video on case one, um, the SHSH registration calls efficiency study. Um, this is going to be due um, Saturday 1119 uh, by midnight. Um, and I just wanted to uh, go ahead and do a video where it's essentially me reading through these directions and kind of talking through a little bit over them just to kind of give you a gist of what I'm expecting that maybe um, isn't obvious by the directions or anything like that. This is this is just something that I would typically do um, in like a normal style class, uh, like an on, a non-online version class. So I just wanted to go ahead and read through it um, and sort of maybe preempt some of the questions that you guys would have by, by answering them. Um, as I read through this, there's definitely a lot there. Uh, there's definitely a lot of content that needs to be done. So I'll give you some suggestions on on timing of this and <clears throat> and all this kind of stuff. Because if you backload this, this project is just going to turn out really, really, really terrible. So I don't want it to turn out terrible. I want it to turn out really professional looking. I'd love for it to be a joy to read and, and all that stuff. And, and I want you guys to get something out of it too because... This is the type of analysis that is the whole point of this course. I mean, you, you, right now you guys are learning different concepts and, and, and collecting different tools from different chapters. But realistically, it's to be able to analyze things in the real world. So this um, set of data is actually a subset a set of data that we're using for this, which all this can be found on Springboard. The directions are found on Springboard. The data set is also found on Springboard. But this data set is a subset of an actual real-world data set from um, one of the other business stats professors. They, in a previous career, collected a bunch of data for um, for a hospital system, and yeah, so we, we took a, a portion of that data that would be, I guess, manageable to use for you guys, and we're going to be analyzing it um, in some different ways. So this is very much a real-world data set, um, and yeah, this is, uh, this is just a way to apply the skills that you've learned and the skills that you're learning. Okay, so first off, I'd say um, the one thing, if you've already read through this, which I actually suggest you reading through this before watching this video, um, just because then you'll be able to like actually kind of have a, you know, have your bearings on what I'm talking about as I, as I go through it. But you'll notice some of the tools um, or some of the skills that we ask you to use and some of the, the tools that we ask you to use um, you haven't learned yet. Um, and that's okay. Um, but I wanted to give this to you guys as soon as possible uh, so that you would get started on the things that you have learned um, and then to not backload a lot of the work. Because if you backloaded a lot of the work, one, there's going to be that much more work in a short amount of time. And then two, you, you may have forgotten some of the earlier concepts um, that are that are going to be in this case. Okay, so I'd love for you guys to get st started um, on the earlier concepts now, and then that gives you more time to converse with me, ask questions, ask you know, well, you know, details and all that kind of stuff. So here's what I'll do: I'll go ahead and read through this. I'll give you kind of my two cents, and then I want you guys to ask questions in the discussion on anything that you're. Um, uh, confused on, unfamiliar with, anything like that, okay? All right. All right, so case one, SHSH registration calls efficiency study. Um, this is due to the Dropbox by Saturday, 1119 at 1159 p.m. Please turn in one project report per team as a PDF document. Um, I might change that and I might say PDF or Word. I haven't decided on that yet, but I'll definitely communicate that to you. But I guess for now, just assume that it has to be turned in as a PDF. Um, if anybody has questions on how to make a PDF, it's actually really easy um, in all the later versions of Microsoft Word. Um, you can convert directly to PDF just when saving the file. So I think, well, I'm sure that you can do it on, on 2013 and 2016, but probably 2010 as well. Um, I don't know if you're using Google Docs, if there's a way to convert it just straight from Google Docs, but if there is, then great. Um, I would suggest using Google Docs when kind of collaborating and working together. Um, that way you'll have one document. Um, you guys can kind of see the formatting as other people are working on it. 
And the great thing is, is you know that you all already have logins to it because you all have a um, at zips.uacron.edu email address, which is powered by Google. So you have Google Docs um, within within your abilities already. So you don't have to have a Gmail account. Like you technically already do have a Gmail account through the university. Um, so that's that. Um, okay, yeah. Also, please submit your Excel data file that includes your analysis to the same Dropbox. So uh, fairly shortly, fairly shortly, I'll be creating a Dropbox for this case. Um, and that's just where you'll submit everything. So you'll submit two documents. You'll submit the Excel um, data and you'll submit either, you know, the PDF or the Word document for the report. Okay, so the Word document is going to be very extensive. Um, and it's going to consist of a couple of uh, different sections, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but like the Excel data just needs to be what you use to come by all the data that's in your actual report. So I would like the Excel data to be organized in a decent fashion to where it's easy to navigate, you know, maybe just in the tabs, make it very apparent what I'm going to be looking at in each tab. But realistically, when I grade this, I don't want to have to go to the Excel sheet to figure out, you know, what is going on. Um, when I grade this, there's going to be a lot that's going to be subjective and there's going to be a lot that's going to be um, specific to your group, specific to research questions that you came up with. So I'm going to have to do a lot of work on my own just to recreate um, the results of the question that you're posing. So I'm going to have to kind of do an independent um, test that I have to run or run independent confidence intervals or whatever it is. So I'm going to be checking your work against my work and I'll hopefully just be looking at the report. Now if something is like drastically off then I might go to your Excel sheet but in no point in the report are you to reference the Excel sheet or anything like that. Um, and I really don't want to have to look into it but it's good to have that there because then if I see you guys go astray um, in some capacity, then I can go back and look at that Excel sheet and say, oh, okay, well, they made a mistake here. They accidentally switched this variable with this and whatever, and, like, that's why their numbers are so off. Um, hopefully there's nothing like that, but at least if I can see kind of what you did, then I, I know that, you know, it wasn't a careless mistake or it wasn't a clueless mistake or anything like that, and then, I, then you won't get dinged um, real bad on the grading or anything like that, okay? So that's that. All right, so this is these directions are uh, partitioned into three big sections. So there's the background information, which is like the setting of um, where we're doing this, why we're doing this sort of thing. Um, there's the analysis, and this is the what. This is like, you know, what we're going to be doing. And then the grading guidelines, section three. Well, and a portion of this, it's all going to be the how, okay? The grading is like the real stringent portions, like this is what you must have in it, um, and the how you have it is both in the grading and in the second portion under the your analysis will include. Okay, <clears throat> so let's get started on section one. In today's hospital environment, there are many factors to consider to make sure that patients receive the highest quality and safest of care. It doesn't end there though. With consumerism on the rise and many healthcare organizations competing for the same patients, there is a string incentive for healthcare organizations to provide excellent customer service as well. One way in which this is done is through managing the first impressions that patients get through the registration and scheduling process for non-major incidents, such as um, outpatient surgery, tests, etc. And I think the important thing to note about this non-major incidents portion is that when you go in for a major incident, you know, like say there's an emergency or a trauma or something, it's not like you're choosing a hospital. You, you're not like, you know, you just, you need to go, so you go to the nearest hospital. Um, so for a non-major incidents, we're talking about things where like, really, if need be, it could wait, but you decide to go to the hospital, so you have a choice of which hospital you go to. Okay. One such facility has noticed that some of their patients are not being notified of appointments soon enough. 
This leads to patients leaving for another facility to have their tests performed and also can leave them wondering if their insurance is going to cover the specific uh, procedure. At Super Healthy Systems Hospital, SHSH, the management team has identified a possible issue with the customer service and seeks to understand the situation. One of the ways in which they think the staff can help um, is by calling as many patients as possible each day. This analysis of the number of calls made in the Scheduling Registration Center is meant to have a positive relationship with customer service. The idea is to ensure patients receive a phone call before they would seek care elsewhere, and also to put them at ease regarding insurance issues. So basically, the more calls, the better. Um, and the idea being that if we can get to these patients and ease any uncomfortableness that they have, they're, they're less likely to look elsewhere and go to a different hospital, okay? Section two, analysis. The standard that has been achieved when looking at historical records shows that each staff member should be able to call 17 patients per day, baseline. Okay, so that's an important number. Um, this, is what we're gonna ex this is what we're gonna expect of the data. So when we look over at this data, we see, um, and we see employee uh, numbers, which, you know, is what it is. It's just kind of identifying an employee. We see pre-training number of hours. We see post-training, or sorry, pre-training number of phone calls, post-training number of phone calls, uh, which shift they're on, what's their gender, and what's their level of experience, okay, in years. So it's saying that the goal that we're supposed to have um, as a baseline is that the worker should be able to call 17 patients per day. So we can see in this data that some people are, some people aren't. Looks like pre-training is a lot of less than 17. Looks like post-training is a lot of 17, greater, close to 17, that sort of stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Training was conducted for a total of 100 uh, days. It should be days. Um, and evening workers, oh, I, never mind, it should be day. Training was conducted for a total of 100 day and evening workers. Um, note that that's going to be N, right? Like this is going to be the number of pieces of data that we have, so 100 workers. And their performance post-training has been summarized along with other demographic characteristics. Here are the variables that are are in the accompanying Excel spreadsheet. This is what I just mentioned. Employee ID, that's to identify the uh, employee rather than using name or anything like that. Pre-training score, so the number of calls uh, before the training that they would average per day. Uh, Post-training score, number of calls they would average um, per day after the training. Shift, day and evening, so what shift they're on. Um, gender, male or female, experience in the job, number of years, and I think we grouped that into four different categories. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be um, like a number. It's going to be uh, like a categorical variable, right? So we have below two, two to four, four to six, and above six. We don't have very many below twos. Yeah, there's a few down here. As a new manager, you are eager to analyze this data and provide recommendations to your superiors. The purpose of this uh, first assignment is to describe the data, propose possible research questions for future investigation, and begin to use inferential statistics, um, which are confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So these inferential statistics are basically saying that we have some idea of what a population um, consist of with like the number of calls that these people make, right? So like when we pluck a hundred data points, um, we're not getting a full picture. We're getting a hundred data points. We don't know how many, um, that the average, uh, worker calls per day. Like we don't have the complete information. We have a hundred data points worth of the complete information. We actually don't even know how many people work in this hospital or how many shifts there are, or anything like that. Um, but we we want to use inferential statistics, which, like I said, we haven't learned yet, 
Um, confidence intervals are in chapter 8, and hypothesis tests start in chapter 9, and then continue on um, through the rest of the course. Um, but the idea of both confidence interval and hypothesis tests, all of the inferential statistics, is that we take data from a sample, we use tools that we have, and we make inferences about a population. So we take the data that we have, which is a sample, and then we're going to draw conclusions about a population using the data that we have from the sample. Okay, because the population is known to be like the truth. We want to know, we want to make assumptions about the truth, but we can't know the truth unless we, we can't know the truth unless we have the whole population. So what we do is we take a sample because maybe that's more economical to take a sample. And then we draw conclusions from the sample with a certain level of accuracy or a certain level of confidence or a certain level of likelihood of being true. We draw those conclusions from the sample about the population. Okay, that's that's the whole point of, of all this testing. So granted, um, so I think uh, early in chapter one, we talked about the difference between uh, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. And a descriptive statistic might might mean, oh, well, we have a mean of whatever this is, a mean in, in the sample or in a population. So that's something that we know. We, we see the data. We've calculated that data. Okay, but the inferential statistic portion of it is like, okay, now that we know what that mean is, what does that say about the population that we're looking at? What does that prove? Does that, does that prove with a certain confidence that the population might? have a mean similar to this or that the popula or that the mean of a population might be more than we previously thought it was so inferential is about making inferences it's about using evidence or data that you have the tools that you have to try to make inferences about the population okay so descriptive is just literally calculation inference is about drawing conclusions on those calculations okay all right um so it says, uh, formulate, write, and test your hypothesis regarding whether the training was effective and if any differences uh, exist between the groups that work in the call center. Okay, so that's an idea for maybe a potential research question. Um, include descriptive statistics, graphical representations, and confidence intervals to support each of your research questions. All right, so that's important too. Like the descriptive statistics you're going to calculate, you can do that using Excel. You can do that using Megastat. Um, but you're going to calculate those, make them look pretty, um, show some graphs, make those graphs look pretty, make sure all of this is on point with um, like looking organized and together, and make sure it has a logical flow. Confidence intervals, we have those on there as well. Based on the standards currently in place, management would like for the average registration calls to be 17 per day. We uh, kind of mentioned this a little bit. You will need to determine whether or not the average number of calls appears to be significantly less than 17. Okay, so that's going to be a hypothesis testing question that you're going to do. And like I said, you'll learn that in Chapter 9. So, um, you know, we'll handle those uh, as we go along. In addition, management is concerned about the variability in the number of calls overall, as well as within each of the levels of shift and employee gender and employee gender. This may take or they may consider taking action if any standard deviations are determined to be significantly above one and a half calls per day. Um, so this is another uh, type of hypothesis. Uh, this is another type of uh, single variable uh, hypothesis test or one sorry one sample hypothesis test that you'll learn in chapter nine um, so yeah that's that and so overall it says your analysis will include descriptive statistics including at least three visualizations okay so these are the this is the concrete nuts and bolts of what must be included and the descriptive statistics you guys know how to do this is mean standard deviation variance median mode um, uh, lots of you know n you know, the number of data points, all that kind of stuff. Um, it will also include three research questions to be investigated. Your first one is given to you, right? So the first question should be, did the training program significantly increase the number of calls made each day? And um, then 
consider the various categorical nominative, nominative variables in developing other research questions. So you're going to have to uh, develop two other research questions. Do not propose a research question that you would not be able to analyze using the data already collected. Okay, confidence intervals for all employees as well as gender specific and shift specific. So that's going to be, um, I guess, five confidence intervals. So one for all employees, um, one for male, one for female, one for e uh, morning, one for evening. Sorry that my phone keeps going off, guys. Um, okay, so then one stable hypothesis test for the mean against the benchmark for all employees, as well as gender specific and shift specific. So there's going to be five tests right there as well. Um, that's going to be um, just for all the employees, that's going to be one test. Then you're going to run a test uh, male and female. So, or one male, one female. So that's three tests total. And then evening shift and day shift. So that's a total of five tests. And then one sample hypothesis test for variance against the benchmark. Um, so when it talks about these benchmarks, in four, the one sample hypothesis test for mean, the benchmark is 17. And then in five, one sample hypothesis test for variance against the benchmark, the benchmark is 1.5. So the, uh, um, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking at. Uh, okay, for all employees as well as gender specific and shift specific. So, yeah, that variance, that's going to be five tests as well. So one for all employees, one for male, one for female, one for evening shift, one for day shift, okay? Then it says two sample hypothesis tests for the mean, pre versus post training, that's one test, uh, day versus evening shift, that's uh, one test, and male versus female, that's another test. And hint, hint, you might want to use these, um, those tests to come up with some research questions. Hint, hint. <clears throat> okay, so the grading guidelines, overall professionalism, overall quality of report and investment of suitable effort. This is one that is a huge, 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 huge deal for me. Okay, I've, I've taught this class now. This is my second semester teaching this class. I'm teaching two versions of this class this semester. So I've got really high hopes for you guys. Last semester, this, this professionalism aspect was really, really poor. Um, so here's the thing like you might want to run by like the uh, the report by me before you turn it in and ask me if i like the way that things look or any um updates that or any or any changes that could be made anything like that like i have no problem with you guys communicating as as much as possible with me in order to do a good job on this on this case so communication is always going to be a good thing um, but I don't want this to just me never hear from you and then you just turn it in and then it's like, you know, looks like not at all how I wanted it to look and I'm really unhappy about it and then I have to take away, um, you know, lots of points from the professionalism aspect because this is literally 20% of your grade. This this case is worth 50 points and professionalism is 10 of that. Keep in mind that you really want to view this as, this whole thing as, a document that you're handing to your boss or your manager um, and this is this is going to be something that you have the expertise on and they need to know answers for right so they might not have expertise but they are definitely going to need to know answers uh, for the questions that you're that you're bringing up or that are posed in this okay so two executive summary summarizes all the results found slash reported in all appendices versus only describing what tasks will be performed without reporting the actual result. Although it appears first in your document, you should write it last. Okay, that's very, very, very important. Don't start with the executive summary. Okay, if you start with the executive summary, um, you're going to find yourself like trying to fit stuff into it. You should do all of your data, all of your calculations, all of your appendices first, and then decide what you feel is important enough from that to put into the executive summary. The executive summary is to be one page, okay? Or the, or the, the one page version of it is, is supposed to be one page. There's a title page, which I guess is kind of included in that or whatever, but the content portion of the executive summary is to be one page um, and it needs to be concise and it needs to have, uh, I don't want it to have a lot of numbers on it, 
Okay, so like the numbers and all of the calculation is for the appendices. The executive summary is for concluding and summarizing your your results. You wouldn't hand a, something to your boss and then have him um, have him or her like have to like really like kind of navigate through the math and like really try to figure out what's going on. You want to summarize that form and then if they want to dig deeper, you have a little reference point there that's in like a superscript. You know, like maybe it references Appendix A. And so then you'd go and then they could turn to, to Appendix A, which is presumably organized in a, in a good fashion, and then look a little bit deeper. But the executive summary is your conclusions. Okay. Okay, so I had to take a short break when recording this video, so I think we were on executive summary um, so yeah I think I had mentioned um, about the title page and the one page summary um, so yeah we'll just we'll just run through those again so I'm looking at section three um, and uh, number two so summarizes all the results found reported in the appendices versus only describing what tasks will be performed without reporting the actual result Although it appears uh, first in your document, you should write it last. Um, and yeah, and then I stressed that. Okay, so now I remember where I was. Um, the title page that includes your team number and names. Um, so yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. It doesn't have to be anything too amazing. Um, a one-page summary, single-spaced, um, but double-spaced between paragraphs. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, the summary should clearly summarize important descriptive statistics and the confidence intervals and results of hypothesis tests from your appendices, right? So you should summarize these. That doesn't mean we want to know every number, um, but you should summarize these. So in a summary, that could literally be one sentence for for whatever it is. One sentence for a descriptive statistic, one sentence for the hypothesis test. And then you just put like a little um, annotation or, uh, you know, just like a superscript um, to where you could find that in the appendices. And then it's really easy. If I want to dig deeper, if your quote unquote boss or manager wanted to dig deeper, then they would know exactly where to find more information on that topic that you'd summarize in the executive summary. So you summarize it in the executive summary. Oh, boom, there's a 13 right above it. Okay, well, that means that I would go to, you know, 13, you know, back in the appendices. So pretty self-explanatory. Then it says, explain why you chose to include particular statistics. For example, if you believe the median might be better than mean as a measure of central tendency for a particular variable, explain why, either in the executive summary or in the appendix. Um, and then the executive summary should have a logical flow, include um, including an introductory paragraph and a conclusion. The executive summary should refer to your appropriately labeled appendices um, by label, appendix A, appendix B, appendix C. Um, yeah, I just want those to be superscripts, as I mentioned a few times. So not, I don't want to see in parentheses appendix A, appendix B. I mean, that just looks really, really clunky. Um, the executive summary should refer to your appropriately labeled appendices. Oh, I just read that. Um, research questions at least three. Uh, make sure they're justified and make practical sense based on the analysis provided. Right, so you were given one question um, up above, and you're going to have to come up with two more on your own. Okay, um, identify any possible limitations to further analysis of your research questions, such as small sample sizes or outliers, stuff of that nature. So we'll learn a little bit more about small sample sizes um, and outliers. I guess maybe we'll talk about it a little bit when we get into sampling in Chapter 7. Um, but yeah, I mean, outliers is, as it sounds, something that doesn't fit the data for any number of reasons. And small sample sizes, we'll see what like an appropriate sample size is to draw conclusions about a population um, going forward. I think in Chapter 7 we hit that. Um, the main purpose of me putting out this video is to get kind of give you guys some, some level of confidence that you can get started on it. 
And really what you can get started on is the stuff that we've already done, which is the descriptive statistics, right? So I, I, I hope that you guys feel compelled to communicate with each other, communicate with me, get started on the descriptive statistics, and then just ask a bunch of questions. Because once we get into these other topics, you're just not going to have a lot of time to like kind of go back and do a bunch of stuff. All right, so number three, copy and paste all relevant computer output into your appendices. Now that doesn't mean that like whatever it looks like is what it looks like in the appendices. Like it needs to look pretty. It needs to be concise. It needs to have logical flow. Like it, it I don't want to just see computer printout, like format it, you know, make sure that like, I, and, and, and don't get me wrong. I don't mind seeing a lot on one page in the appendices. Like that's, that's not a bad thing. I don't want this, I don't want this paper to be 30 pages long, you know, like if I would imagine it'll be around 10 pages long um, with all the content um, in the appendices, but if you could do it in six, great. If you could do it in five, great. If it takes you 15, okay, then it does. But like some of the stuff that you could um, do to help make it not be a significant number of pages is just make your graphs smaller, make your print a little bit smaller um, in the appendices. That's okay. Um, and just make sure that it looks concise. Um, okay, so B, label all appendices and refer to them by label in the executive summary. Um, yep, I mentioned that. All right, so now we're at 3B1. Decide which of the variables in the data set are most relevant in trying to answer the main research questions posed in the case introduction. Okay, fair enough. Include the two the two response variables. Um, so make a section A1, A2, etc. for each of these and provide the statistics that will describe central tendency such as sample mean, median, variability, and shape of the data. Okay. <clears throat> so section A of the appendices is the descriptive statistics and I believe within the descriptive statistics um, I'm looking for it here. Uh, oh, 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 I can't find it. Okay, um, include a screenshot or output, um, for example, Megastat, with the information and provide a sentence or two that summarizes the variable's descriptive statistics. So like I said in the last thing, like I don't just want a screenshot or an output, I want it formatted pretty, okay? So, the, I mean, it can be a screenshot or an output, but it, it better not look like junk. You know, I want it to look pretty, I want it to have a logical flow, I want the sentence to make sense with, um, with whatever the data is showing, okay? Um, you can also analyze some of the predictors variables distributions here in preparation for defining your upcoming research questions. For example, you might want to break down the data based on gender and then look at the average calls um, before and after training. Does one gender appear to be more affected by the training? Um, provide appropriate statistics to describe the relevant variables in terms of central tendency, dispersion, um, and shape of data. In addition to quantitative descriptive statistics, you must include at least one graphical representation in your report for each of your research questions. Include confidence intervals for the pre and post uh, training mean calls and justify your choice of a confidence level. It is suggested that you choose one confidence level and stick with it throughout the analyses. For example, if you decide on a 95% confidence uh, level, you should use a significance level of 0.05 through the through all the analysis that's just meaning that like whatever alpha we choose um, when we're doing confidence intervals or hypothesis testing stick with that alpha don't change your alpha flung table is an example of how you might summarize your confidence inter interval results that's kind of nice so we provide you with just kind of a format to make the confidence interval um, look pretty okay one sample hypothesis test appendix B these uh, hypothesis tests should be conducted only using the post-training data. Okay, so that's important to note. Uh -oh. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, conduct the appropriate one sample hypothesis test to determine if there is sufficient evidence that the average calls are significantly less than 17 for the overall calls and um, also calls divided by shift and gender. Um, this requires a total of five individual tests. And remember, this is what we talked about um, a little bit ago in the video. Um, so, yeah, actually, I'll let you guys just read through two and three. I think they're pretty self explanatory. Um, but yeah, uh, go ahead and ask me any questions. Uh, that you'd like in the uh, in the discussion forums for the case um, but yeah if I were you um, get with your group email your group get in contact get started on the descriptive statistics portion I know a lot of this probably sounded like um, just a foreign language in regards to the confidence intervals and the hypothesis testing but trust me um, it'll it'll become more clear um, in a few weeks and uh, the confidence intervals and the hypothesis testing are actually really really logical um, I would say maybe even more manageable than some of the other stuff that we've covered are at, up into this point so we're, you'll get very comfortable with the hypothesis testing I think and uh, similarly with the confidence intervals and I think that um, I think that this case will will be fairly manageable but the thing that you must 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 do okay is communicate with me all right. There is no excuse. There's no, you shouldn't have any reservation. I'm happy to help you with all this stuff. I'm happy to answer any question you have. You know, I make, I make these videos, but it's not like I'm going to go back and edit all 37 minutes of content. So like I may have misspoke. I may have gotten something wrong. Um, so when I ask you guys to ask questions in the forums, um, that's like, you know, your chance to raise your hand in class and have me clarify something. So that's kind of what the problem with these online classes is, is it's really hard to have discourse. It's really hard to have back and forth. Um, so, yeah, so I really, really, really want you guys to ask questions. I'm sure I misspoke on something here, um, but I did my best to describe as much as possible. I know that there's a lot of information here. I know that this thing, that this um, thing repeats itself a little bit, um, but it it all repeat uh, repeats itself, I think, because one of them is describing format, and then one of them is describing grading and all that stuff. So, so yeah, you're gonna have a lot of hypothesis tests. You got to come up with three research questions, and you got to run a bunch of descriptive statistics. But I, I really, really, really don't mind answering any questions you guys might have. Um, so yeah, please ask away, and um, I'll, I'll probably be reaching out um, regarding this case uh, as we move forward and after test one and all that kind of stuff. So, all right, thanks so much, guys. Um, yeah, let me know if you have questions. All right, bye-bye.